Again, I am, um, guys, I am blown away at everyone who is here this morning considering what it looks like outside. Um, Again, I just think that's awesome. Um, We are not rushing the Holy Spirit this morning, but we have cut out announcements, uh, the announcements and a few other things so that we could just stick to the nuts and bolts of why we came this morning. Amen? I want to uh, just, uh, first of all, I want to just say a quick uh, welcome to a dear friend of ours who's been uh, starting to come to Liberty Church. And Amy, would you just stand up real quick and can everybody say hi, Amy? I'm, I'm doing this because when my wife and I came to Liberty Church back in 1999 at Bethany Assembly of God in Agawam, uh, Amy Breton was a part of our youth group. She was an instrumental leader. When I went to the district office, Amy served with me a number of years in our district camps. She used to babysit our kids. Uh, she's just a, 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 a great friend. And uh, the last eight years or so, uh, life has had us a little disconnected. Recently, uh, God's reconnected us. And over the last month, uh, I think this is maybe Amy's fourth time here. Um, I'd love to see her keep coming. I don't know what God's doing, but I want us just to say, well, Amy, you're welcome here. All right. We love you. One more welcome back. This is welcome back. Anybody ever watch Welcome Back, Carter? I don't know why that just plop, popped in my mind, but <laughs> we want to say welcome back, Pastor Sam. Amen. So Pastor Sam's back from Kenya. Big, big old smile on Elizabeth's face today. We're glad you're back and safe. Loved all the pictures and loved all the testimonies that you've been sharing and look forward to passing those on soon. Amen. Prayer and fasting have long been considered powerful spiritual disciplines and practices. Many church, churches at the beginning of the year, they enter into a time of specific prayer and fasting. Many churches do the 21 days, like what we're doing here with our surge. And not only do these spiritual practice deepen our relationship with God, but they also, I believe, they unlock breakthroughs in various areas of our lives. Say unlock. This morning, we will explore, explore a few key ways in which God's word leads us towards experiencing and walking in the breakthrough that Jesus Christ provided for us. Now, what is a breakthrough? A breakthrough is a significant and transformative moment or experience in your life and your journey, your spiritual journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's often associated with overcoming certain obstacles, barriers, limitations that are present in our life. And there's often a sudden shift or advancement that takes place in your life. It's a breakthrough moment. And I believe, as I said a moment ago, that I believe the Lord has brought Liberty Church to a breakthrough moment. Someone say, praise God, by faith. I believe that God has brought many of you to a breakthrough moment in your own life. I want you to think about some of the following, and this is not an exhaustive list, but think about this. Spiritual growth, deliverance, freedom, healing and restoration, victorious living, direction, clarity. How many of you heard one or more areas of need in your life for a breakthrough or the life of a loved one where you would just say, a breakthrough is needed in that area? Can I see a hand this morning? It's important for us to understand that a breakthrough ultimately is a work of God's grace. It's a work of God's grace and his power at work in our lives. It's not something that can be achieved solely through our own personal effort or by coming up with a great plan or strategy. Listen, I want to pause there for a moment and I'm going to come back. We're going to sandwich this with the grace of God this morning, but I want to pause there for a moment and I do want to say this, that Maybe not in every case of breakthroughs, but most definitely in most cases, there is still an effort required on our part. Over this last week on the Arise Prayer Challenge, God has led us on Thursday, Friday, and, and I'm sorry, thir- uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to pray for excuses. <laughs> in other words, we're tired of making excuses. Pastor Tim is tired of making excuses. And we were praying over our own lives, over our families. We were praying over our church because there are too many of us and all of us are guilty of making excuses in our life, whether that's spiritual excuses or at work excuses or in the family excuses. And I believe that God was leading us as a part of being on the threshold of this breakthrough that we cannot be content any longer with making excuses. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Excuses quench the work of God in our life. They quench the power of God at work in our life. 
Excuses dismisses our responsibility and our part to take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. His word speaks very clearly to us about effort required. (laughs) Again, the only way breakthrough comes is solely, say solely, solely through the grace of God and his power. But God's word tells us there is an effort required on our part. He brings the great breakthrough, but I'm not sure how that breakthrough comes unless we're willing to stop making excuses and start taking up responsibility and making the effort. Second Peter 1, three through five says this. The first part of these couple scriptures tell us how God has set us up for success. He has set us up, established us in Christ Jesus to walk a breakthrough out every day of our life. Hallelujah. He says this. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. I want to pause there for just a moment. God has done everything needed for him to do for you and I to walk in victory. He's given us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and shed his blood. He paid the penalty for our sin. And for those who have faith in him, we are completely forgiven of our sin. We will one day inherit eternity. And that sin no longer should have a stronghold on our life. If you believe that, say, I believe that. That's what God's word tells us. He gave us his word that the Bible says is a lamp unto our feet. (laughs) It It helps us navigate and direct our course in life. He gives us his word, which is our firm foundation, an anchor upon which we can stand and never be moved or swayed by the winds or the storms of this life. Someone say, praise God. And then, (laughs) if, if that were not enough, he gave us, Jim, a deposit of eternity. He gave us a deposit He gave us his Holy Spirit, hallelujah. He put his spirit inside of us, not making us God, but making us a person who does not deserve the love or the grace of God, but that has been given complete forgiveness of all of our sin. And then he's put his spirit inside of us as an insurance policy that as long as we stay surrendered to him, that he will empower us to do this thing right. Amen. Hallelujah. So he has set ourselves up to succeed. But then Peter says this in verse five. He says, for this very reason. In other words, since you understand what God has done for you, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. And then he goes on to list uh, down through verse 11 many things that we're to supplement our faith with. I'm giving you an assignment today on this snowy day when you go home, all right? Before you go out and shovel or snow plow or before you do whatever you do, make snow angels in in the yard. I don't know what you do. I want you to read 2 Peter chapter 1. Read at least through verse 11 if not the whole chapter. It's an awesome chapter. And, and, and read what, how, what Peter says we need to make every effort to supplement our faith with. But as a part of our effort, we are to seek God and we are to ask him for his intervention into our situations. We're also to align ourselves with, with his purposes and with God's word. And through, and though we are to make every effort, again, I told you I was gonna sandwich it with the grace of God. Though we are to make every effort, at the end of the day, it's ultimately that breakthrough moment is a gift of the grace of God in our life. But listen, this is what God did for us. If we were even to try without God, without his word, without relying on his Holy Spirit to handle our situation, just know this, you would mess it up miserably. (laughs) You would not succeed. It would just become more chaotic, more entangled. As a matter of fact, if you're in a situation in your life right now that is needing a breakthrough moment, whatever that might be, and it seems like you're trying and you're trying and you're trying, and it's just becoming more and more entangled and more and more chaotic, and, and it just seems like, okay, what's going on here? 
I'm pretty confident that you're probably trying to take care of the issue on your own strength and of your own power. Because when God gives us direction and we follow that direction, his direction always works. Now, I understand that when, it, when we're married, I'm married, many of you are married, I understand that in a marriage, there may be one party willing to follow directions and the other party's not. Well, that is a problem. But when both parties are willing to surrender to the Lord and follow his directions, I'm pretty confident in stating from this pulpit that your marriage will receive healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus. Because God will never mislead us. If we try to do it on our own, it's kind of like this. My, my home, where I was born and raised, is the Omaha, Nebraska area, okay? And it's 1,400 miles from here. Trying to do it, things on our own is like me having to walk or run my way to, back to Omaha to visit my family and friends. Uh, that would take some effort. That would take a lot of effort. <laughs> that would take several days, and it would just be miserable. But when we rely upon the the things that God has given to us, made accessible to us in order to address these breakthrough needs in our life, it's, it's, it's rather like me getting into my automobile <laughs> and driving 1,400 miles. Still effort required, but a lot less work and a lot quicker to get to my destination. Some would say, that's good, Pastor Tim. I say that's good because that's not in my notes. God dropped that in the first service and I was like, wow, whoa, that, that was good, that was good. That's what it's like. It's like getting in our car and driving somewhere. It makes it so much more easier rather than trying to do life on our own. And I'm sorry, but I know this because I've been a Christian my whole life and I've been guilty of this, but there are moments, regardless of my knowledge of God's word or my experiences past, that I still have been guilty of trying to do things on my own. And until we get to that place where we just recognize it doesn't work, <laughs> it only continues to mess things up, uh, it's only at that place where we come and to surrender to God and we understand that it's only by the grace of God. If you remember, the apostle Paul had some sort of issues. Many people believe it was a physical issue, uh, uh, but he had some sort of issue going on in his life. And three times he asked the Lord to take that issue from him, and the Lord refused. The Lord said, my grace is what? Sufficient for you. Sufficient for you. So it's only the grace of God. I believe that God, when he speaks and he moves, that we can follow that direction, and we can experience the blessing of it. Now, there are moments uh, where there are things that happen in our life that we're praying for, and we're doing everything by the book, but it doesn't seem to be going in that direction. For example, uh, we've been praying this week for a 29-year-old woman named Emma. She's on life support, uh, one, of our, our, one of our congregation, uh, who's a chaplain at the hospital, alerted me to it last Sunday. We've been praying for her all week long. Uh, Friday, they were supposed to pull her off of life support. She has a four-year-old son. She's fighting some sort of bacteria in her body. And the good news is that um, I found out yesterday on Friday, they did not pull her off of life support. So I believe, okay, maybe our prayers are working, amen. I'm believing that by faith. But listen, there are moments in our life where we're praying for a person and we're praying for their healing and the healing doesn't come. We did everything by the book. We did what we were supposed to do, but the healing didn't come. And that's when the words of the apostle Paul need to, or that, that God spoke to the apostle Paul need to resound loudly within us when he spoke to Paul and he said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Some things in life that we're just never gonna understand. And even though we did it by the book, God has a sovereign will and plan for this life that is beyond our understanding or comprehension. All we know is that his will is good and perfect in every way. And so we come to that place when we did it by the book and it went a different direction where we simply have to say, Lord, I thank you for your grace. May it give me the power I need to make it through today. Amen. Amen. Praise you, Lord Jesus. But there's still an effort required on our part. And I believe with all of my heart that God is trying to wake up his church, not just Liberty Church, his church, to stop playing church and to start being church, to stop making excuses and to start taking responsibility for that which God has given to us and done for us. And let's, let's, let, 
Let's start experiencing together these breakthroughs in enormous measures. Now, there are several different ways by which we seek breakthroughs, all coming right from the pages of Scripture, and they're all for our use. We seek breakthroughs through prayer, through fasting, through worship, through the studying of God's Word, and making application of that Word in our life and walking in obedience. Those are, those are some ways that we seek breakthrough moments in our life. That's what we've been doing during Surge 21. <laughs> we've, been, we've been not eating or we've been not surfing the internet or, or doing social media or, or whatever it is that you've been fasting and we've been giving that time to the Lord, dedicating that time to the Lord so we, we can eliminate all distractions and the spotlight is fully on God to do what he wants to do in our lives. And during that time, we're praying, we're listening, we're fasting, we're worshiping, we're studying, we're receiving and trying to walk in obedience to what he's telling us to do. Also, breakthroughs come as we seek God, but we also speak, uh, seek spiritual mentors and pastors and leaders and coaches and, and counselors to, to partner with us and, and to help us navigate the word of God in our life. For every believer seeking God for a breakthrough, there should be also this. And this is what I've been praying for at Liberty Church. For each of you, I've been praying for this. A faith-filled expectation in what God desires to do in your life. I've been praying that God would raise up our faith, fill us with faith. Salvation comes by faith, breakthrough comes by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he did for us. I've been praying for you. I've been praying that faith would arise to a level in you like you've never experienced before. <laughs> that you would have a faith that no matter what you're going through in your life right now, you believe God's on it and taking care of it, exclamation point, amen. We're at the tail end of the Surge 21, and I believe that we are at this threshold of breakthrough, personally and as a church. Now, prayer and fasting are vi a vital part to this breakthrough, vital. That's why we do it. And not only should we do it during Surge 21, or a couple times we do a mini surge during the year, um, and we just play around with that word surge, just kind of like, um, as I said on Thursday night, it's kind of like playing Pac-Man. Any Pac-Maners in the room when you grew up playing Pac-Man? You know what Pac-Man is? Yeah? You know how you're going around eating those little, those little dots, and then all of a sudden you eat the big dot, and you're super powerful Pac-Man. You can destroy anything but for you, at least for a time. <laughs> That's what Surge is like. It is meant to empower us, but we've got to keep doing it, and not just at the corporate call, <laughs> but we do it on our own accord as God leads us to do it for whatever reasons. Amen. And it's in those moments of prayer and fasting and giving God special focus that we're able to more clearly discern what God is trying to do in our lives. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 17 and read verses 14 through 21 together. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, because of your lack of faith, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence unto yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then we read verse 21, how be it this kind, this, this breakthrough only goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So do you think prayer and fasting might have an important piece in the breakthrough in our life? 
There is a, a lot in that scripture that we just read, but here's what I wanna extract right now. Prayer and fasting are not mere spiritual practices, are disciplines. They're not just that, but they're essential spiritual disciplines that you and I must put into practice in order to walk in the victories that God's laying before us to walk in, hallelujah. We've got to have that dedicated time with the Lord. That's what fasting is all about. It's releasing all the, all the things that have a hold on our life and it's throwing it all off, casting it all off and getting alone with God, putting the spotlight on him and just saying, God, you've got my fullest attention. No Facebook during this time. No television during this time. No food during this time. God, all that I need, I need you to give me, and I need to hear your voice, oh God. And Lord, I am not going to move from this place until you tell me to move. And God, I need to hear your voice. That's how we cry out to God. Not with the phone in our hand. Not with the television on in the background, we get alone. That's why the Bible said we go into our prayer closet, that place where no one else can see us. It's just you and I, it's just you and God, and, and he's able to speak to us because we've blotted out all the distractions. When we set aside time for prayer and fasting, this is what we're doing. We're prioritizing God. We're prioritizing his presence and his power in our life we are inviting him to work, work mightily on our behalf for our breakthrough, for our breakthrough. Matthew 6, says this, and, and most of you all know this scripture. <laughs> it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first. Seek first. Seek first. Just a question for you. Don't answer it out loud, obviously, but, but answer the question for yourself. Are you seeking God first in your life? Especially, I'm speaking to those of you who have a breakthrough that you need in your life. I mean, you're, you're, you're not happy on the inside. You know something's not right. You might have an idea, it's the spiritual, but maybe even you're confused in that. My question to us today as a church, praying for a church-wide breakthrough, praying for your personal breakthrough, are you seeking God first? Jesus, because there's a promise here that if we will seek God first, all these things will be given to us. He shall do for us. He shall give us the breakthrough. He shall bring the clarity. He would bring the healing. He will bring the finances. He'll bring that need that's that barrier. It seems mountainous in front of us. He said, if we would have, uh, seek him first and have but faith in God, we can say to this mountain, be removed, and it shall be removed, cast into the sea. Amen. So if our answer to ourselves is honestly, no, Pastor Tim, I'm not seeking God first in my life. It's not He's not the first on my thing on my mind each and every day. Matter of fact, when I open up my, my day planner, my electronic planner, um, you won't even find time with him written into the pages. There's a really simple solution, even though it may seem very difficult, and that is starting now. <laughs> Choose to seek God first. If he's not on the pages of your day planner, write him in now, today. Get him on that day planner. Time with my Savior, who gave his all for my sin, that I did not deserve the gift that he gave me, but out of his great love for me, he gave it to me because of his great love, Amen. that I might know him and walk with him, and that he may use my life to bring his life, to bring him glory and honor and to help lead others to that hope that lives inside of me. Our God is such a good God. That's what I love about God. The world sees God as an angry God. You've heard me say this before, but I've, I, if those of us that know him, we know he's not an angry God. You know what I've learned about God? He's a good God. You know what I've learned about God? He's a patient God. You know what I've learned about God? That it's his will that none would perish, or, but that all would have everlasting life. That's what I know about my God. Yes. 
I know that he will use discipline to make me a better person, but his desire is not to stick me into the corner and punish me. <laughs> he wants to discipline me, uh, prune me, uh, correct me so that I can be walking in the will of God as he desires me to be walking, amen? amen. So this morning, anytime we feel like, whoo, that hit me hard, it's only because God love you, loves you, but the answers are always simple. And that's why people think salvation must be too good to be true. He died for us. We, by faith, receive that gift of grace. And our sins are completely gone. And we're freed up to follow after him. Amen? Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 7, says this. And this was included in a prophetic word that we read here publicly that, one of our, our, that was given to one of our uh, church family and they presented it to uh, our, uh, us pastors and board. And uh, anyway, here's the scripture, Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 7. Is this not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness and to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? <laughs> what's, this, what's Isaiah talking about? He's talking about breakthrough. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and to not hide yourself from your own flesh? A part of the problem, a part of the hindrance in the breakthrough period in our life is that you, is that you and I, we get stuck in, in, in keeping our eyes focused on what we need a breakthrough in. Are you following me? Instead of letting God's word lead the way, it says that his word is a lamp unto our feet. He directs our path. His word says, don't keep staring your problem in the face. Rather, go out and feed the poor. Go out and clothe the naked. Go out and bring the homeless into your home. What did Jesus say? Go out and serve somebody. Are you with me this morning? Get your eyes off your problem and start serving people. And it's in those moments that God somehow supernaturally will begin to address where you need breakthrough in your own life because you laid it down, you put it aside, and you began letting him work to love on someone else. Praise you, Lord God. Through prayer and fasting, we develop a heightened sensitivity to the voice of God, God's word, and to the Holy Spirit. And as I've already said, he will never mislead us. He will never deceive us. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When we pray and fast and intake the word of God, we have a greater focus, we have a deeper hunger, and we have a greater thirst to understand his will. What I'm holding in my hand right now is the will of God. <laughs> Many people seek the will of God. God, what's your will? It's right here in Genesis to Revelation. Now, does he have a personal will for my life? I'm talking about some people want God to direct them personally. And, uh, and this is his will. And as we follow it, he begins to lead us. That's right. He begins to lead us in that personal course. Sometimes he gives us little cues. Sometimes when we're little, he deposits it in your heart that you're going to be a pastor or you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. He, he puts some direction in your heart that helps you begin to focus forward. But we primarily come to know the will of God by reading his word. Amen. And that's where breakthrough is often found when we begin to apply it to our life. God promises breakthrough, folks. Promises. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Pastor Bill read this last week. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, and their fasting may, see, may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will what? He will reward you. That, that's a promise. Now, that doesn't mean we can't come together during Search 21 and pray together. That's not what it's talking about. But what it means is hopefully beyond that hour once a night, if you've come, beyond that, in your private time, you're making time with God that nobody else sees. Are you with me? 
It's important that we come together to pray. It's important that we come together in our times of fasting. There's biblical models where the prophets called for, for a national fast. So, so there, there's biblical model for that. But what Jesus is talking about is too many people, it's just a show for them. They show up so people think they're holy or think they're righteous. But then they go home and they can't even recognize them from the person that they were in the prayer meeting. And so we need to make sure that, that if we want the reward... If we want the reward, then we're getting personal time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's jealous for you, and he wants to spend time with you. Amen? Amen. First John 1 John 1.19 says, I want to just talk three, quickly about three, three things that are essential for the breakthrough. John, 1 John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The first thing that we have to do, and it's essential for us to receive God's gift of grace, that is we have to confess our sins to the Lord. We have to ask him to forgive us. We have to admit that we're a sinner and that we need a savior. And, uh, and we do that by, by having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and why he died on the cross. When we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're acknowledging the why he died on the cross. I'm a sinner, and I need a savior, and I'm confessing that by putting my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says here in 1 John 1, 9, that when we confess our sin, either for the first time, or as Christians, if we stumble and sin along the way, if we confess our sin, it says he's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sin. And this is what I like. This is how I interpret it, and I think most do. Without, without any contingencies attached to it. In other words, there might be earthly, if, we, if, if, if I go out and murder someone, can I be forgiven for that? The answer is yes. And in heaven, I will not be penalized if that was a sincere confession and sorrow for my sin. On earth, might I still need to carry out some consequences for those actions? So when it says here that he forgives us, I believe that's instantaneously and eternally you'll never be held accountable for your sin. Eternally you will never be held accountable for your sin. Though in this world there might be moments of time that we have to walk out consequences for us. But that's the natural world in order of the, the laws of the land. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. So we have to confess to the Lord and we have to receive his forgiveness. And then, uh, and then there's a second part to confession. That's essential to the breakthrough. Next, after we confess to the Lord, and that's all that's needed for salvation, but if we want healing to take place inside of us, then in James 5.16, it says that we are also to confess our sins to one another that we might be what? Healed, healed. Mental, me mental emotional healing, physical healing. When we confess our sins one to another, then we're healed healed. There's nothing can hold us any longer. We've confessed to the Lord. We've confessed to each other. We're fully free to let God do what he wants to do inside of us. Amen? Praise God. When we choose, I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come back up. When we choose to be open and honest and transparent with our struggles, what it does is not only does it benefit us and help us in that breakthrough moment in our own life. But it also, when we do that, when we confessing our sins to one another and inviting them into our lives, it frees them up to do the same. Does that make sense? It frees them up to do the same. There have been times that I've confessed my sin from this pulpit and confessed that I don't see myself as a perfect person. And, and I can't tell you how many times there have been one or two or maybe even five people that have come up afterwards and saying, Pastor, thank you for doing that. It freed them up to then also be open themselves about and be real. That's we're just all real. We all have struggles in life, amen? We all need breakthroughs in different areas of our lives. And, and God wants to give it to us, and it, we must confess to God, and we must confess to one another. And then the power of prayer. We cannot ignore it. James 5.16, again, emphasizes the power of the effectiveness of prayer. And uh, when we're prayed over by a righteous person, we're going to talk about that in a moment, but there's power in prayer. Why do we pray? Because there's power in prayer. Why do we pray? Because prayer is effective. How does it work? I don't know. <laughs> I just know that the Bible tells us to pray. And when we do, God works supernaturally in our lives and in our circumstances. And then righteousness is a significant piece of breakthrough. 
How do I find a righteous person to pray for me? How do I, how do I, where do I find a righteous person? How do I know who a righteous person is? We know a righteous person if they've put their faith in the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. If they believe that Jesus' blood was shed for our sin and that God raised him from the grave uh, and, and that he was victorious over death and uh, that through him we have salvation, then that person is a righteous person. And God's word tells us that. How do we know if we're righteous if we believe that? Now, in and of ourselves, I understand and you understand I'm not righteous. Apart from Jesus, it's impossible for me to be righteous on my own. Therefore, I'm not going to go confess to an unbeliever my sin. It will do me little to no good. I'm to confess to a believer, a brother. If you're a woman, you confess to a female and you let that righteous person because of their belief, their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ pray over you and there will be a powerful dynamic that takes place in that moment. Romans 3, 9 through 12 says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are all under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. No, not even one. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, Isaiah says that our attempts to be righteous apart from Jesus Christ <laughs> are disgusting in the eyes of God. And it's one of the reasons why Jesus was so much at odds with the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they, re, they, they refused to believe in pure belief towards God and they were considering themselves righteous, trying to anyway, by their own self-righteous acts. And that made Jesus disgusted at them. Isaiah 64, 6 says, we have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. The bad news is, is that we can't be righteous apart from Jesus Christ. But the good news is that in Jesus Christ, we can be made righteous. Because when we come to him in faith, he takes that robe that's blood stained, his robe, and he wraps it around us and we're clothed with his righteousness, the blood of Jesus Christ, which washes us clean and makes us white as snow, amen. amen. And we're righteous only, say only, 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 only. Are we righteous, are good enough because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And it's because of what he has done for us that you and I can experience that breakthrough. It's at hand today for many of you in this room. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made himself to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is an amazing truth, an amazing truth. Would you stand all over this place this morning? In just a moment, I'm gonna invite you to come up, but one more time, I'm gonna ask, as I did in the beginning, if if you're in need of a breakthrough in some area of your life or family or work or any number of other situations, God knows, maybe others know, or maybe only you and God know, but you're just saying, Pastor Tim, I need a breakthrough in this area of my life. Would you just by faith raise your hand this morning? Be honest. There's many of us in this room. In just a moment, I'm gonna open up these altars. Nothing magical about the altars, but I believe there's a dynamic spiritual thing that happens when we do come forward to the altar. It's a statement that we make. These altars are open, and I'm gonna ask you to come, and before you head out, let God finish what he's doing right now in this moment. This message only goes so far, and then you and God pick it up from there. But here are the keys to breakthrough. Obviously, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Number one, all right? But then from there, it's prayer. It's fasting. It's studying the word of God and making application of it. It's confession, both to God and to each other. It's putting on daily the righteous robe that Jesus Christ gave to us. And then it's our fullest dependent that's upon the powerful 
Holy Spirit gift that's been given to us as a deposit of all eternity to come. <laughs> Hallelujah. So two things. There may be some here today are listening online and you know you need a savior. You, you know you're not saved, but you believe and you felt the presence of God in this time together this morning. We're gonna have people with lanyards up here and this isn't what saves you, but they would love to talk to you. If you either have questions or you're ready to give your life to the Lord, they would love to pray with you and lead you in that moment and share that moment with you together. We had at least one in the first service who gave their life to the Lord for the first time. Can we give the Lord a hand clap? The other thing that I want you to come forward for, other than just letting God have his way in you, is if you've never been baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, we were talking about that. We're on a pause in the study of the book of Acts, but we had a lot of time built into those first uh, six to eight chapters talking about the Holy Spirit's role in our life. And... Uh, not every, we believe that the baptism is a distinct moment from being saved, that the Bible teaches that. And uh, these were believers gathered together in the upper room, and they were seeking God as he had instructed them to do, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and they spoke in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And listen, I don't want your, I don't want your uh, focus to be on speaking in tongues today, and this is why, though I do believe it's the initial physical evidence of the Holy Spirit, but this is why it shouldn't be your focus. Those disciples in 120 in the upper room had no idea what tongues was or that they were about to speak in tongues. They just wanted the promise of the Father. Amen? So if you want baptized in the Holy Spirit this morning, my, my, my challenge to you is just come forward and say, God, I want your promise. Fill me up. The other thing that shows that we have the power of the Holy Spirit at, alive and well and, and that we've been baptized in it is there's a boldness that comes on us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's very evident. It's very clear. Those who have been filled with the Holy Spirit, we live differently and he helps us. And so this morning, there's a number of reasons why you might want to come forward, whether you do or don't. Let's continue to seek God before we leave. One more song, and then we let God have his way. I love you. We're praying for you. And we're at the threshold of a breakthrough. And listen, this might be the day for that breakthrough. And so in your time of closure with the Lord this morning, if you feel the presence of God come upon you in that area of your life, then I want you by faith to grab a hold of it. And I want you to claim it and say, God, I thank you for this breakthrough. And then I want you to leave this place in faith today, believing it's taken care of. And keep walking in it day after day, moving forward. And watch, watch, watch what God has done. What God has done, past tense. The breakthrough has come. And we want to celebrate that with you. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord.